to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. In this series, we dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending me your comments or questions via the CGTM page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at thepointwithlx at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We live stream Headline Buster on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Beijing time and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Fridays. So do join me during the live streaming and get in touch. I would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. Today's show is our first in the Lunar Chinese New Year. We are celebrating the New Year of the Tiger while we're in the middle of the 24th Winter Olympic Games, a good vantage point from where to see how Beijing 2022 is hitting the headlines or also, of course, how the headlines are hitting Beijing 2022. So let's start at the very beginning as the song goes, the opening ceremony on February the 4th. Acclaimed film director Zhang Yimou, who had also directed the opening of the Beijing 2008 Summer Olympics, wove artistry, high technology and emotions into magic. The ceremony, themed the story of a snowflake, highlighted the idea of togetherness. In an innovative touch, snowflake-shaped placards bearing the names of the 91 participating delegations converged to form one giant snowflake which was the cauldron for the Olympic flame. Many media called the ceremony spectacular. By the morning of February the 10th, we've seen some amazing records being set in speed skating, figure skating, short track speed skating, freestyle skiing, mogul and other magic moments and the games are going on as we speak. Now, the International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has called Beijing 2022 an extraordinary achievement. He said, this opens a new era for global winter sport. It will raise the global participation to new levels. But uh, how have the foreign media portrayed the opening ceremony and the game so far? We did a data, a data analysis using articles on Beijing 2022. We selected five major English language media, CNN, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times and the BBC, and searched for keywords such as Winter Olympics and opening ceremony from February the 3rd to the 7th, and we found 58 articles. And guess what? The great majority of these headlines are negative sandwiching the games between geopolitics and political issues such as human rights. But some are more objective and positive, especially when it comes to the non-political subjects such as the artistic values of the opening ceremony and the organization of the games. So what do most of the headlines talk about? Excluding keywords such as Olympics and Beijing, China and Wega top the frequency followed by words such as diplomatic, boycott, Putin and athlete. Exactly how negative are these headlines? Well, in the general news category, the CNN had the highest number of negative headlines, 9 out of 14, a whopping 60 percent and above. But percentage-wise, the financial outlet Wall Street Journal topped the chart with six negative headlines out of seven. That's close to 90 percent. What was the tone of the CNN, which had the most negative reports in this time frame? Well, it either tried to put a label on the foreign dignitaries visiting China for the Games, or focused exclusively on COVID prevention measures, or anything that had to do with boycotts. Specifically, the CNN inserted more political elements into the reporting as well. This chart shows how often the opening ceremony reports had specific agendas such as geopolitical relationship between China, the US and Russia. So, yeah, let's take a look at this word cloud and you'll see what I mean. In a nutshell, despite some objective reporting, Beijing 2022 was cast in a negative light. Was this a surprise? 
not if you have been following our program and using your common sense. But what do sports right, have to do with political issues? Should we then start raising the same or similar questions for every host country of sport events? Or do we have a double standard here? The message seems to be very clear. Some seem not to be happy to see China deliver. That China opened the games on schedule in fanfare is a disappointment to them. There are other missing pieces in the big picture, but uh, let me try to fill them out in uh, some individual analysis of uh, individual reports. As I mentioned, the word Wager appeared frequently in Western headlines. This representative piece says, for instance, in a provocative choice, China picks an athlete with a Wager name to help light the cauldron. An athlete with a Wager name. It's about Chinese cross-country skier, I guess, uh, Dini Ge Ila Mujiang, who was one of the two final torchbearers. Now, instead of calling her a Wager, calling her a Wager because she is a Wager, the report says she was of Wager heritage. But Dini Ge Ila Mujiang is from Altai, a skiing destination in China's Xinjiang Wager Autonomous Region, and she's won a silver for China at an International Ski Federation Grand Prix event in 2019. Some simple research could have established her background, but why the vagueness and insinuation? Did the newspaper not want to admit that Xinjiang is part of China and that Uyghurs are part of the Chinese family? China is called provocative here. But if China hadn't chosen a Uyghur athlete representative, would the detractors have given us a break and not dredged up this issue? I guess not. Now, the Olympics are supposed to break down barriers, but instead we have seen a section of the media hell-bent on dividing the world according to people's origins. The next outcry came when 80-year-old Gu Ailing, that's her Chinese name, or she's known by her English name as Ailing Gu, when she won the women's freestyle skiing Big Air for China. Born in a mixed family, she changed her nationality from American to Chinese in 2019 to join Team China. But some American media are almost calling her a traitor. Listen to this. It is incredibly, I think the only word we can arrive at is ungrateful for her to betray, turn her back on the country that not just raised her, but, but turned her into a world-class skier with the training and facilities that only the United States of America can provide. For her to then turn her back on that in exchange for money is shameful. Wow. I know Fox is fringe, but it has a big following in America, so I want to address this. Now, it's a normal thing, okay, around the world that talents flow and exchange and enhance exchange while honing their competitive edge both for themselves and for the country they join. Snowboarder Janice Spiteri, for instance, is representing Malta at Beijing 2022, but still, but until 2014, she competed for Team USA. During the last Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang in the Republic of Korea, alpine skier Jeffrey Webb represented Malaysia instead of the US, and athletes of Chinese origin have also joined other national teams. But it seems the outrage erupts only if someone changes citizenship from American to other countries, this, in this case China, and wins. Japanese-American surfer Kanoa Igarashi was called a traitor by some for representing Japan instead of the U.S. in a 2018 World Championship. He responded by saying, it's not war, you know. At the end of the day, it's just surfing. It's a sport. So, come on, America, you are an immigrant nation. How many foreign talents have left their home countries for the United States? Where were the complaints then? Finally, I want to touch upon COVID management measures as one card constantly played to cast a shadow over Beijing 2022. One agency even called it China's pandemic Olympics. What can you call it but scaremongering? When you look at the number of new cases in China, they're mostly in double or even single digit, utterly ignorable compared to some other countries. And yet, these numbers are blown out of proportion. Look at this headline. Omicron deepens uncertainty surrounding Beijing Olympics, or this, COVID cases mount, as athletes, personnel arrive in Beijing, or this, 
The coronavirus continues to sideline Olympic athletes as they gear up for competition. So exactly what numbers are we looking at? According to China's National Health Commission, the average number of new cases in China in the seven-day period from February the 2nd to the 8th was 62. Wow, that's a real flare-up, right? And these cases are really mounting, jeopardizing the safety of people. Come on. Now, some foreign journalists are finally conveying the right message. Here we have a podcast in which an American journalist who came to Beijing tells the inconvenient truth. Listen. People in China were able to live largely normal lives. I mean, they had to wear masks. They still had to measure their temperatures when they went into places. But for the most part, there really was very little virus in the country, as far as we know. If you look at the graph of COVID deaths and cases in China, you see a big spike in January to April 2020. But then after that, it basically just flatlines. I mean, if you even look at the death toll today, China has only had 4,600 or so deaths from the coronavirus. What it takes to admit that China has done something right. And uh, there are many more examples I can give on just how some media maximized hiccups or concerns as if the games in Beijing are full of flaws much more than ever before. Artificial snow, for instance, is another case in point. They tell you Beijing uses a lot of artificial snow, but not that it's common practice among previous winter games and that great pains have been taken to ensure sustainability. Beijing 2022 is not perfect. Nothing is. There are hiccups and glitches, but they don't represent the games. The Chinese organizers and the Chinese people have been giving their best, and that's been widely recognized. Anybody with common sense will have seen that the games have consolidated bonds of fellowship and sportsmanship and set new records all the time. That everyone comes together despite differences is what the Olympic spirit is all about. Let's take a break here, but we'll be back with our distinguished guests, including a Winter Olympian, to discuss all of the things I talked about uh, for the past uh, half an hour. So stay with us. Let's see what comes in the mail today. Oh, this is the puck that the players go after in the ice hockey. A closed disc is also referred to as a flat ball made of vulcanized rubber. According to the latest rule, a puck should be about 2.54 cm thick with a diameter of 7.62 cm. It weighs about 156 to 170 grams. It feels pretty light, but during the game, it can reach a speed of 160 km per hour when struck. That's why the players are wearing heavy protection gear. The pucks are frozen before games, so they can glide smoother and faster, and bouncing can be reduced. The warmer they are, the more they will bounce when whacked with the stick. There are six positions in ice hockey. Three forwards consists of a center, two wingers, two defensemen, and a goaltender. One of the primary responsibilities of a center is to win face-offs. This is crucial in order for their teams to gain possessions of the puck. While the puck is in offensive zone, centers will be found dictating the play from the middle of the zone. In most cases, this will be where the captain is. The players on the wings are the primary goal scorers. These offensive-minded players normally have a great wrist shot and slap shot. During a regular play, there will be two defensemen on the ice per team. Pretty straightforward. The primary objective for defensemen is to stop the opposing team from scoring. Centers are seen as the primary playmakers of almost every team. Therefore, they will get the most assists, which usually lead to the most points. 
So what to look for in a game? Basic skills of ice hockey include stick handling and skating skills. It's more about teamwork and how fast a team responds. The ice hockey events will be taking place at the Wukosong Stadium and the National Indoor Stadium during the Winter Games. Stay tuned on CGTN to see who takes home the gold. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin and this is The Point. Welcome back to Headline Buster, and uh, I am uh, pleased to introduce to you our distinguished panelists joining us from different parts of the world. They are Michael Christian Martinez, who is a world-class first Filipino Olympic figure skater. Welcome, Michael. We also have Mr. David Ferguson, who is editor with the Foreign Languages Press and uh, Professor Huo Zhenxing from the Chinese University, from the China University of Political Science and Law, uh, joining us from uh, Beijing as well. So warmest uh, greeting to uh, the three gentlemen. Uh, let me go to Michael because uh, it's rare to have a guest from the Philippines and also as an Olympian joining us during this very special moment of time. I'm really happy that you are able to join us. So uh, tell us a bit, uh, Michael, I know you are the first Southeast Asian figure skater, right, to make it to the Olympic Games. You participated in Sochi and in Pyeongchang as well, but how come this time you're not able to join us in Beijing? Um, unfortunately, I had to withdraw from the qualifying event because I got injured prior to the oh. qualifying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this doesn't stop me because I'm still trying to continue training and so in the hopes that I can qualify on the next one. Yeah, all the very best uh, luck. So you have been watching, you have been watching the games from the Philippines. How, uh, ha what have you seen so far? What are your in impression of uh, how things are going in Beijing? I think that is pretty amazing. It's really amazing, and I've actually been watching the two skaters, like Yuzhu Han Yu and Nathan Chen. Especially Nathan Chen has set a world record at this at the short program. And I'm um, actually wishing good luck to user Hanyu of Japan, who's gonna set a world record too as well. He said that he's gonna be attempting the first quad axle at the competition, so yeah. Yeah, so actually the competition is still going on at any moment, so it's a very exciting time. And I think it's very uh, good perspective that you have because you have participated in different games in the past, as I said, Sochi and Pyeongchang. So what are your imp impressions comparing what you're seeing now uh, on, on the media, of course, uh, what's happening in Beijing and what uh, you personally experienced in Sochi or in Pyeongchang? I think it's a, an amazing feeling and just to be able to compete at the Olympics and to be with the, you know, uh, high level athletes and everybody's so friendly and everybody's just amazing. Yeah. How have the Filipino media covered the, uh, the events? Is it uh, quite extensive and the tone of the reporting? Do you think that they are doing a reasonably professional job in giving people the information they are interested in and they, they would like to know? Uh, yes, actually, there's been a lot of uh, articles and a lot of news about the uh, this Olympics, uh, especially because we have a one representative representative from the Philippines who's going to be competing this on on the 16th of February uh, for alpine skiing. So everybody's super excited. Everybody's super positive, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the the show, the nature of this show is doing media critique, and you have also followed what I was saying during the first half of the. Uh, have you noticed the kind of tone that's um, you know generally felt in many English language, especially mainstream media um, that are out there? But you know the kind of feelings that uh, are felt by the Chinese and and from the stories that are written by the Chinese media here seems to be there seems to be a gap for us. Um, I, honestly speaking, I've been only, you know, I've read a couple of our news articles mm -hmm. and all I can see and re read or, you know, see it was just everybody's just supporting the athlete that's going to be comp competing at the Alpine skiing. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That's uh, your own perspective. Let me turn to our guests, uh, David Ferguson and uh, Huo Zhenxing. Both of you have been 
of course, uh, uh, either living in China or Chinese, and you have watched the opening ceremony. Tell us a little bit your first-hand impression of things. Uh, David, let's start from you, because uh, you had the privilege to see the, uh, the ceremony with a ringside view. Uh, view. How does it feel? Good morning, Hosin. Yes, morning. Uh, I was lucky enough to be at the, at the opening ceremony. Uh, it was a spectacular event. Everything about it was enjoyable. The whole Olympic Park was lit up when we arrived. The ceremony within the stadium itself, well, we had these spectacular uh, special effects, some of which I don't think I've ever been seen before, turning a two-dimensional ground and a and a wall into a three-dimensional uh, experience. The, the marching of the athletes, I think they must have been very moved and inspired by that. We had a statesmanlike speech from Thomas Bach, um, the flag-raising ceremonies. But the thing that actually struck me most was the volunteers. When we arrived, there were volunteers to usher us in, waving and cheering and clapping. The and volunteers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the volunteers. Um, when we left, at 11 o'clock at night, the same volunteers were in the same place, still waving and clapping and cheering and wishing us a happy new year. Mm. These people had practiced for weeks as volunteers. Mm. Their job was to stand in the same place in the freezing cold for maybe 10 hours. Yeah. And when we came out, they were still the same happy people that they had been when we arrived. And I think they really, really deserve credit for that. And I know that some of the athletes have been commenting on Twitter yes. uh, about the volunteers. And that, to me, was the most memorable part of the experience. Mm. We actually dedicated a special program to the volunteers as well, not just for the the training that has the, that they have received, but the time, the f sacrifice they have to make. You know, in this holiday time, where every, you know people join with their family, and they have to go into the closed loop. Some of them have to stay in there for weeks, even even longer. So. Um, a lot of credit really goes to these unsung heroes. Um, Professor Huo, you were also at the opening ceremony. What was your impression? Well, I think it's a really amazing experience to be an audience to attend the opening ceremony in the Burnett Stadium. Well, uh, that evening is cold, but I feel very warm. The atmosphere is, it's, you know, it's very exciting. And there is a lot of uh, unforgettable moment in the opening ceremony. And I think that there are most the most exciting uh, moments uh, are the following. The first is that when I find that the way that the Olympic flame was lightened, mm. it it is a surprise all of us. But uh, when I watch that moment, I feel you know, I feel I feel it's fantastic because the torch was just put inside a huge snowflake, right. uh, and that huge snowflake is composed of a great number of smaller snowflakes representing every participating countries. So this makes me feel that, yes, we are coming from different countries, but we are one family. That's the value of the Olympic Games. Olympic Games give us a hope that we can, you know, we can unite together. And the other moment that touched me most is that, that the speech made by Thomas Bach, the uh, president of the Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, mm. he says that, uh, well, it is possible that the, the, the fee, to be the fierce rivals at the same time they can you know live respectfully and uh, uh, you know peacefully, and it, and then the, the audience give a very long applause. Another sentence he says that he appeals to all political authorities to give peace a chance. This an audience also give him a very long applause. So I think that his speech touches the heart of audience and mm. touches the heart of all over the people. Yeah. Uh, I wonder whether these messages have been sent adequately uh, through the international press to the you know, audiences around the world. That's why we do this segment of uh, media analysis, because we felt that's not the case, because uh, a lot of the articles actually center around you know, geopolitical tensions, as I said, or China's so-called human rights record, and so on and so forth. And you know, even athletes' performance could be um, sidelined, I would say, or overshadowed by 
uh, a particular athlete's political stand on certain political issues. So let me go back to Michael once again. Uh, I know it is uncomfortable for athletes to talk about these issues, and we try to avoid these kind of questions to uh, athletes who take part in our program as much as I can. But still, if you go and read the media, you can see somehow athletes are made to express their political opinions on certain issues, whereas you know, they're here to take part in the games, you know, to, to put on their snowshoes, to put on their skaters, and nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. So how do you feel if um, um, you would be pressed on your political opinions on certain issues, and if you don't have, uh, if you have a different opinion, then you'll be criticized, you know, for even taking part in certain events? Um, for me, I think uh, as much as possible, I try to avoid that at the same time. But uh, personally, I just think that, you know, whatever the situation or or the challenge is, I try my best to really, where a lot of athletes actually, they just do their best to be able to surpass that and mm -hmm. do what they need to do. So, yeah. yeah. I think you make a per perfect point, you know, because after all, uh, we want to keep sports as uh, pure as possible um, to you know, get the noises out of the way. It is a touching moment. Uh, David, let me go to you, um, because you, have, you are a journalist and you analyze uh, reports from around the world as well. What has been your impression of the kind of reports that you have had uh, your hands on? Well, um, Lucine, I was working as a journalist back in 2008, the Olympics then. Uh, one of the things that I remember most about that was a story that was spread by the Western media in 2008. One and a half million Beijing residents evicted to make way for the Olympics. I mean, even by any common sense standards, that is just stupid. I researched the story very carefully and I know what was behind it. And I hope that you will give me the opportunity sometime to come and talk about this in detail because we don't have that today. But the whole story was a complete fabrication. We fast forward 14 years and what have we got? The whole Western media plastered with these stories about Xinjiang. One, two, three million Uyghurs in concentration camps. Again, simply from a common sense perspective, that is nonsense. A log the logistical operation involved in forcibly moving three million people into concentration camps, and there is not one trace of actual evidence. The people that are telling us this story have got satellites up there that could take a picture of an umau on the sidewalk and they haven't been able to produce a shred of evidence. And that is the thing that strikes me most. It's the same pattern, a huge number that makes no sense, being repeated again and again and mm. again, until it starts to gain credibility for that reason. Yeah, um, but uh, David, what do you think is behind this kind of report? Um, I, I, I'm not going to say that everybody who writes about the Beijing Games are ill-intended, that they are deliberately twisted information. Some of them, I guess, uh, have a real genuine intent to do a good job. Other people may have been misled or other people may do, may really have uh, bad intentions. But uh, um, how, would you, how would you describe the kind of mix of uh, pictures we're seeing here resulting in the kind of reporting we're seeing? Well, I'm afraid I take a slightly less positive view than you do. I think that there is a narrative which to a maximum extent, Western journalists are expected to respect. They have a narrative to tell. What's behind it? A whole host of different things. But you used a word. You made, you made reference to a word that you were actually quoting. The use of the Uyghur girl in the torchbearing was described as provocative. Now, that's a very interesting word. Who exactly was being provoked and how were they being provoked? It comes, from, um, it comes from a spirit of arrogance, because if I ask the people who wrote that word, how is it provocative? Who is it provoking? Who is, is it provoking and how is it provoking? Basically, it's provoking them. The story is about them. They have a right to have their views respected and followed. Uh, and uh, so 
arrogance is a part of it, but there, there's a lot more to it than that. Mm -hmm. And again, I hope that you'll give me the, the opportunity to come and talk yeah. about it in detail, okay. because we have limited time today. Sure, sure. Um, Professor Huo, let me get your take on the situation. Are we really exaggerating the negativity of these reports, or are we being too small-hearted to say China or you know, we, the Chinese people, are not able to take criticism, that we see the whole world turning its back against us? Or are we really talking about some real substantive problems here? Uh, I, I, I also noticed that, the, you know, the, uh, the articles or newspapers or from the Western media. And I, yes, it, it is, I, I find that the, the key words on the Beijing Winter Olympic Games is not uh, sports or uh, you know, uh, 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 or other things, but we find that it's a human rights issues, uh, uh, or artificial snows, or Uyghur girls, or even uh, Russia I invasion. Uh, so I think that the, this conflicts the spirits of the Olympics. I think that the, the Chinese, we know, as you say just now, we know that we are not perfect. The country are not perfect. The world is not perfect. There is nothing perfect, but we. Uh, welcome the criticisms, uh, different opinions. If they, if only they are, you know, kind-hearted and constructive. But we do not like, you know, the blinded or arrogant uh, criticisms that contradicts the okay. essence of of of, of, sure. of the of, of the Olympic Games. Sure, um, Michael. Let me ask you one last question. <laughs> it's again a question that's very much. Uh, um, being discussed on the social media, which is about nationality of athletes, because there are some, you know, um, American, uh, formerly American athletes who changed their citizenship to being Ch to becoming Chinese, and and she won, and she got a lot of criticism from the press in the United States. But if you look around, there are a lot of these cases, even in this game, you know, even in the current game. So, what is your view on that? I I think it's just. It really comes from the the athlete's decision of which country he want he or she wants to represent, and I think that you know they're just doing what they love to do, and I think that not a lot of people should really criticize that or really um, decide for the athlete. So yeah, I, I get your point, and I think that 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 is a fair point that's shared by a lot of people here as well. David, very quickly, your opinion. Well, I think that athletes have a right to choose whichever country they feel like representing. I think it's very interesting that uh, some athletes are now choosing not to represent the US, and that's another thing that the US has tremendous difficulty with. They, they've spent a long time boasting that everybody wants to go there, and now they're facing a situation where some people are actually choosing in terms of their uh, affinity to leave, and they, they're having a hard time coping with that. Professor Hua? I think the, you know, the importance or the essence of sports is to unite people together instead of divide them. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ellen Goose, his her own remarks at the press conference is 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 very is is very good. Yeah, she said, you know, she is not trying to please anybody. She is just following her heart. She is well intended in what she does, and uh, she deserves some credit. Anyway, many thanks. Time is very limited, so many thanks to our guests joining us from uh, the Philo from Los Angeles, actually. <laughs> um, Michael Christian Martinez, a uh, mm -hmm. Filipino Olympic figure skating. David Ferguson, editing from editor from the Foreign Languages Press, and uh, Professor Huo Zhenxing from China University of Political Science and Law. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of uh, Headline Buster. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I hope you will continue to follow us on Facebook and. Twitter or other social media platform using the handle Lushin in Beijing. Thanks for joining us and uh, you've got the point.